Good afternoon and welcome to another episode of Omen G's Stupid Scary Stories. Today I'll be reading once again from Thomas D'Agostino and Arlene Nicholson's Connecticut Ghost Stories and Legends, part of the Haunted America series. Once again, we're in the section, a brief collection of ghostly grimoires. These are little short stories. And after each of these little short stories, if I've had any experiences with these particular locations in my travels as a pesticide technician for Mosquito Squad, I will share them with you. If not, I'll just move on to the next story. So, today, Burlington's Lampson Corner Cemetery. <clears throat> this old burial ground dating back to the early 19th century is home to some active spirits. Many passerby have seen orbs and odd streaks of light emanating from the cemetery. There are trails that run along the edge of the graveyard and hikers traverse both paths and have caught glimpses of spectral sights that appear before them in the burial yard. Apparitions wandering among the graves have been a common recant among those who dare to venture toward the stones. One unsuspecting hiker came across the cemetery and beheld a man in uniform standing near one of the tombstones. He stopped to watch the peculiar visage for a moment, noticing that the uniform looked very old. He called out to the person in request for the time, but the figure faded away in front of him. The curious hiker slowly crept toward the grave where the man had been and noticed to his astonishment that it was the monument of a World War II veteran. Many others have witnessed such apparitions while visiting the burying yard. Paranormal groups have made it a point to check out the area in hopes of seeing either the strange orbs that float about the headstones or the man dressed in uniform. It has never been concluded as to whether the ghost is that of a person who is buried there or just biding an eternal visit. Perhaps one day someone visiting the cemetery may find the answer. Local historians are not sure how many graves are in the cemetery, as many have been simple field stone or wooden markers that have long vanished from the curious eye. For now, it is a place where some do not necessarily lie in repose. The official deed to the burial yard dates back to February 10, 1812, when Gad Frisbee, town treasurer of Burlington, paid Chauncey Brooks $11 on behalf of the town for a parcel of land to be set aside as a public burial ground. The land bounded south and west on the highway, totaled roughly 90 rods. A rod is an old unit of measurement, equaling 16.5 feet in length. There is also an account of an ill-omened patch of land along Route 69 between Burlington and Bristol that still reverberates with the sounds of an era long gone. Apparently, there was a small community along that stretch of the thoroughfare that supposedly became infected with the smallpox virus. The disease spread to the community very quickly. Those who could escape did so, but most were not so lucky. Now the area is virtually a ghost town where the sounds of everyday life still permeate the air and witnesses see uncanny sights such as horses and buggies rolling ethereally on their way or semi-transparent figures moving along the road. One ghost is said to be a hitchhiker named Abigail. How the name Abigail came to be is one to be puzzled out. It is known that people did not hitch rides way back in the days of the horse and wagon. As for why they are still there, conceivably the area could be a place where the boundary of life and death intersect, where the veil is so thin that it is sometimes crossed over much like that of Barahak and Pomfret. Whatever the case, the village may be gone, but the residents still linger in their daily toils long after their mortal tenure on Earth. The area is at Lampson Corner on Route 69. Lampson Road Cemetery is also on Route 69. Burlington. Yes. I'm familiar with 
Burlington, and I'm familiar with this Lampson Cemetery. Now mind you, I've had this book for a while, long before I started doing my pesticide technician work with mosquito school. So one day while I was in the area of Burlington, I just so happened to say, oh, wait a minute, Route 69, I'm on Route 69, let me go check out this area. And I found the cemetery. I actually took pictures of it and posted them on Instagram quite some time ago. I have to find them. If I do, I'll post them here. May or may not have them, I don't remember. But I do remember the cemetery because when you're driving on the road, there's like a long stone wall. And I was like, oh, let me stop here, you know, take some pictures. And I remember, once again, I'm doing pesticide control. This is during the summertime, so these are all nice, warm, hot days. I remember the day that I went was particularly hot because it was during one of our heat waves. So, hot, humid, I mean, the heat was unbearable, people. It was unbearable. I'm talking like instant sweat. And I was sweating so much, I wasn't used to this. Like, I'd be soaked. But anyway, that's not the point of the story. The point of the story is I stopped at the cemetery and I got out. I went in, took some pictures, walked around, you know, just to see if I could see the things that they say that you see when you go in here. Now, I didn't see the soldier. I didn't see the soldier. But I did see this hitchhiking girl, woman, girl, young lady, whatever you want to call her, which I thought was odd because she looked real. She didn't look transparent. She didn't look ghostly. I saw her walking past the cemetery, you know, with her thumb up. And I'm just thinking to myself, no one's going to stop and pick you up out here. This is fucking the sticks of Connecticut. Number one, they're going to be wondering why you're out here. Number two, they're going to be wondering why you're out here. And that's enough for most people to just keep driving right on by. Connecticut, trust me. Connecticut people are not as warm and welcoming as some may believe. They're actually quite cold and quite standoffish. Eric. And you're probably like, well, you're from Connecticut. You were born and raised in. Yeah, but I was born in a different part of Connecticut. Part of Connecticut that's not known for being a standoffish area. A poor part of Connecticut. <laughs> but anyway, listen. I'm looking at this lady, young lady, well, hitchhiking. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm headed in the direction where she's probably going but for insurance reasons I can't give her a ride so I kind of feel bad that I'm gonna have to walk back to the truck and you know leave and be like nope I can't give you a ride I'm sorry so I decided I'm gonna hang around in the cemetery until she you know passes by then when I hop in my truck I'll just do like everybody else has been doing and just drive right past her right so as I'm standing in the cemetery, I'm looking around at the different stones and things, you know, just trying to waste time. She stops at the edge where, you know, the cemetery wall is. And she just stands there, right? So I'm looking. And like I said, she looked like a real person. You know what I'm saying? She looked like a real person. So this is why I'm thinking of, you know, trying to avoid having to tell her I can't give her a ride. If I thought she was a ghost, it would have been quite easy to decide I'm not giving her a ride and I wouldn't have had to think about it at all. I mean, who wants to pick up ghost hitchhikers? I did that once. Didn't work out too well for me. Didn't work out too well for me, you know? So I'm sitting here and I notice that she's turning her head, right? To look, I guess, around. But her head just keeps going to one side like this until it turns completely around facing me. Now, that right there let me know that this was not a normal human being, probably a ghost or a demon, whatever it was, wasn't of this world. And what made me know this even more so was the fact that her face was grotesque. You say grotesque how? It wasn't the type of face that a human being would have. First things first, her eyes were completely blacked out. The whole entire eye, just black. She had this grin on her face 
that sent chills right down my spine. It was terrifying. I'm sitting here locked in gaze with this lady, Abigail, I guess they call her, who's staring at me. Then she turns her body to match the direction of her head, still staring dead in my eyes. Now mind you, I'm frozen. I can't move at this point. I want to move, trust me, I want to run. But my truck is parked probably about five feet from where she's standing. I'm not trying to go near her or it. Now it's at this point in time that I start to notice she's making these really weird, like, jerky motions. Sort of like what I'm doing right now. And I'm like, what is she doing? Is this a new dance called the Twitch? It wasn't a dance. She was contorting. You could hear the slight sound of cracking, which I thought was just something in the trees, maybe a breeze or something like that, but no. It was whatever these bones that it had were. They were cracking. Every time she would make one of these jerky motions, you would hear a cracking, popping sound. Out of her back sprung two black wings, like dragon's wings, right? To see the blood and some of the flesh of her body fall off of these wings as they spread out. Probably about six feet to eight feet in width from tip to tip. From her arms, more black flesh came, claws on her hands, ripped through the arms of this body that she was encased in, or it was encased in. It hunched down and grabbed a hold of its chest and tore off the flesh that was encasing it. And then the head, the horns came out of it ripped the face right off. And then staring at me was this black winged clawed sharp toothed black eyed creature. I've never seen one of these things before and I wasn't sure what it is or what it was. But I was scared. Because it was just looking at me. It was just looking at me. And it like crouched down both of its hands on the ground and kneeled down on one knee and its wings began to flap. I'm sitting here watching this whole thing. Now mind you, this particular part of the road is not traveled extremely often, but often enough that I figured maybe someone will drive by, hopefully soon, and this thing will take its t attention off of me and I can get away. Where am I going to go? I don't know, because it's still five feet away from my fucking truck. I don't want to run deeper into the woods, because God forbid I run in the woods and this thing comes after me and kills me, then nobody will know that I'm there except for the evidence of the fact that there's a Mosquito Squad truck parked there, and then they'll probably be like, well, you must have went into the cemetery, take a piss or shit or something, and then they'll find my remains. I don't want to be remains. I want to be alive. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to be dead. So... I'm panicking. I'm panicking. I'm scared to death. You would be too, trust me. If you've seen this thing, you'd be scared to death. Now, it started to make this really weird growling sound. It's like a cross between the sound of a growling bear and a growling dog. But at the same time, it was like two sets of growl at once. Then it let out this loud scream. I grabbed my ears. My heart freaking started fluttering. I thought I was gonna have a heart attack or my heart was gonna stop or explode in my chest, one or the other, but my heart wasn't doing what a normal heart is supposed to do. I could feel it. It was like a heavy weight on my shoulders, pushing down. 
like it was trying to sink me into the ground. I looked down where I'm standing and the ground is like shaking. Little particles of dirt are popping up and shit. Little rocks are moving around. And this thing is still just flapping its wings and screaming this loud scream. Now I'm hoping, I'm hoping like hell, that it just flies off, leaves me alone. That's not what happened. It leapt into the air, hovered a little bit in the spot that it was. Then it flew towards me. I couldn't move because I was scared, didn't know what to do. I didn't want to turn around and run away from it. But facing it was scaring me just as much as potentially running from it was. It was like a no-win situation for me. It was a no-win situation for me. And the ground beneath me started to soften, almost like I was standing in mud. I noticed that my feet were starting to sink into this ground. So I, you know, moved my feet, started to shuffle sideways away from this softened ground and away from this thing coming towards me. And he wasn't coming very fast. Well, it wasn't coming very fast, if that makes any sense. It was sort of like gliding over. It was weird. It was like it wasn't using the power of its wings. It was like it was just floating, sort of like, you know, Magneto and fucking X-Men. It's like a floating cross, but his wings were flat. Now, remember, I'm panicking. I'm panicking. I'm scared. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to run. This is before my days of, you know, demon hunting and shit. So I didn't have Rosamu to help me. I didn't have any, you know, holy shotguns or blessed oil to splash on it, just my chemical pack, which was at the truck. I made a decision, I made a decision, and I'm glad I did, because had I not, I don't think I would be here to tell you this story. I ran towards the road, but away from my truck, because the way this road comes, it's like a curve and in this you know cemetery is along the curve so it runs along the curve so i ran towards the part of the road that's away from my truck and away from this thing and i hauled ass i hauled ass i didn't look back i just ran and i could hear his wing its wings flapping you know not faster than it was when it was just kind of floating towards me. And I'm like, this thing is going to try to get me. It's going to try to get me. I know it is. But I kept running towards this road. And to my fucking delight, a truck was coming. Like a dump truck. It wasn't driving super fast because, you know, speed limit was like, I think, 35 miles an hour. So I just kept running. I ran right in front of this fucking truck. Slams on his brakes. Hey, starts yelling at me and shit. I'm screaming and yelling. Help me. Help me. Please. He's like, help you with what? I said, there's something chasing me. He looks around. He doesn't see anything. I look back. I don't see anything either. I don't hear his wings flapping. I don't see this creature that I just saw. Nothing. He's like, what the hell are you doing out here? I said, listen, I was stopped to use the bathroom in the cemetery. And as I'm telling him this, I'm thinking to myself, I'm not about to tell this guy that I seen some kind of fucking winged creature flying around after me. If I tell him that, he'll call the cops. The cops will come. I'll probably be questioned given a breathalyzer test and I got shit to do you know I got a full schedule today I got things to do and I probably shouldn't have stopped at the cemetery in the fucking first place but I did nonetheless so needless to say I told him you know some guy 
was chasing me. It was in this cemetery, you know, taking a piss, and he came out of the fucking woods. So the dude pulls his truck over. He's like, oh, really? He pulls his truck over, he gets out. He's a licensed carrier. So he's got his pistol concealed. Let's me know. Show me where it's at. So, you know, I walk him to some edge of the fucking woods and shit. Like, yeah, right around here. And he just came out and just was coming after him. He looks around for a little bit. Says, hey, you know what? I'll sit here until you, you know, get in the truck and go on. He said, sometimes you get vagrants, homeless people, camp out near these cemeteries and shit and like to fuck around with people. I was like, really? He's like, yeah, we've heard this you know, every now and then. He's like, I drive this route every fucking day. So, yeah, I, I, you know, I'm sorry I yelled at you for running in front of the truck, but, you know, I understand how I did it. He said, go on, go on, get out of here. So, I hopped in my truck and I drove away. I saw him get back in his truck and start driving as well. Now, I'm about maybe a half a mile to a mile away from this cemetery. My heart is still pounding in my chest. Still pounding. I'm looking in my rearview mirror, which I can't really see much because I got a huge water tank and toolbox that's blocking me from really seeing anything out the back of the truck. But when I get to my next stop and I look to grab my, you know, pack and everything, I see these scratch marks in the top of the water tank. Deep gouges. You know, it's made of like polyurethane or some type of plastic. And these gouges were deep. Now, I've knocked these things with all types of stuff. Tools and things like that. I've never been able to scratch it as deep as this thing was scratched. This shit was scratched pretty deep. I mean, these scratches were probably about a quarter of an inch or more deep. And they were probably about six to seven inches long. Like something had grabbed it and said, shh. You know, like it slid off or some shit like that. Or tried to rip it. I'm not sure what the purpose of whatever put the claw marks there was. But there were claw marks there. scared the shit out of me. I'll never go back to that fucking cemetery as long as I live. And I suggest that anybody else who happens to think that that's a good idea, don't go there. Because this was broad daylight, people. This wasn't nighttime. This wasn't the dead of dark. This wasn't some paranormal investigation. It was just me being nosy and wanting to see this supposed ghost of the soldier and the hitchhiker, which I saw the hitchhiker. I can only imagine what happens to those who pick her up. I can only imagine. I'm sure it's nothing good at all. And I haven't heard of a whole bunch of stories of people being, you know, picking up this hitchhiker and disappearing. So my only assumption is that whatever this thing is, when it does get picked up by a person, it must somehow take that person's form and so it moves on somewhere else. And that was my experience in the Lampson Corner Cemetery. Now on to the next grimoire. The Old State House in Hartford. Some places hold a few mysteries of the past that linger regardless of what may be there in the present. The old state house in Hartford is reported to have a few illustrious ghosts roaming its corridors. Charles Bullfinch is said to be the architect who designed the structure that was completed in 1796. It was the center of Hartford until 1873 when the modern state house was built. <clears throat> it was declared a National Historic Landmark in 1960 and is one of the oldest remaining state houses in the country. 
It is presently run by the Old State House Association and is open Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. for self-guided tours. The building can also be rented for special occasions and host various events throughout the year. When the old state house was first ready for use, a local artist and museum keeper named Joseph Stewart petitioned Governor Wolcott to have access to a third floor chamber as an art studio. In return, he would paint portraits of famous Connecticut figures that would hang on the walls of the newly appointed building. Stewart not only painted, but also collected strange artifacts that he displayed in his studio. Customers flocked to his studio to get a glimpse of his collection. The light went off in Stewart's head, and the Museum of Natural and Other Curiosities was born. For a mere two bits, which is 25 cents, people could gaze upon the horn of a unicorn or a two-headed calf that was displayed among other oddities not seen by the general populace until then. It was not long before his collection became too expensive for the cramped room in the state house, so he relocated the museum across the street. Stewart died in 1822 and parts of his collection mysteriously disappeared, never to be seen again. In 1975, the association created a reproduction of the museum on the second floor using newspaper ads and other documents to create replicas of items Stewart once displayed. They then added more items in keeping with what they feel would have been Stewart's taste. Perhaps that is why many think he is still in the old building. Footsteps are heard on the stairs going to the second level and also in the museum, which, upon investigation, seems to be completely void of the living. Maybe he is checking in from time to time to see what is new in his collection. The spirit of Joseph Stewart is not the only one said to be residing in the building. On May 26, 1647, 47-year-old Alice Young was hanged for witchcraft in the Meeting House Square on the spot where the old state house now sits. Also, was the first person to be executed for witchcraft in the colonies. In fact, Connecticut led the colonies in the witchcraft hysteria. From 1647 to 1663, 9 to 11 accused witches were reported hanged in the nutmeg state during this period that ended 29 years before the famous Salem witch trials of 1692. Alice's ghost is also said to be lingering in the area still proclaiming her innocence. Perhaps it may be one of the other accused witches wanting to clear her name. Forty-six men and women were brought up on the charge of witchcraft from 1647 to 1697, although the last reported execution took place in 1663. Whoever the unidentified ghosts are that roam the central walls of the historic house may be a mystery, but the museum is there, so are some ethereal entities that seem to be taken care of. Now, I've only heard of the state house in Harvard. Never visited it. Never really went to Harvard much at all. Not the particular city in the state of Connecticut that I liked too much. When I did go visit, trust me, I wasn't ghost hunting. I was hunting something else. I won't mention what, but something else I was hunting. And I usually found it. But that's not the point. I decided in this case to do some talking with Rosalind because witchcraft, people falsely accused of things, sounds right up Rosalind's alley, as far as I know. So I asked her, what do you know about Alcy? Executed for witchcraft? Oh yeah. I know her. I said, I bet you did. I know you had something to do with it. Oh yeah, I definitely had something to do with that shit. You know, funny thing was, funny thing was, right? She was a nice girl, real nice girl. And it was hard for me to cause her any pain and suffering in normal, regular, everyday life. She was so devout, you know what I mean? Like, killed her parents. She stepped, kept praying. But she didn't suffer. She felt, you know, truly and honestly, that all the things that happened 
But guys, look. Guys, look, she would say. You know? So I decided, fucking one day, you know, she's walking around doing regular person shit. I made like a fireball fly out of the butt. The guy saw it. It was like, how dare they witchcraft practicing upon this land that shall happen here. Went to her house, dragged her out, said things to her, beat her, screamed at her, said that she had turned to witchcraft because she lost her family. Shit. You know what I mean? And another. I started making her shoot flames out of her fingertips, right? And they were talking to her. They were like, oh, you're a witch. You're a witch. She said, no, witch I am not. I am merely a victim of a demon named Rosmo. Because I told her my name. You know what I mean? I didn't care. It's not like they were going to believe it. They thought she, thought she was a witch anyway. So they're going to be like, oh, Demon Rosalind, now you, you know the demon's name. Huh, how do you know the demon's name? Why do you know the demon's name? The demon's name you know, you should not know, because you should not know of any demons. Witchcraft is what you are practicing, and therefore you shall be burnt at the stake. Burnt at the stake after your trial. Now, I don't even understand why they had to the trial in the fucking first place. I mean, they already told her that she was going to be burnt at the stake anyway. So it was like, it was a waste of goddamn time. It was a waste of goddamn time. You know what I mean? But they had this trial. They had this trial. And basically, what a trial is, is a whole bunch of people yelling and screaming at you about witchcraft and shit. And a lot of these people, a lot of these people started making up stories. You know what I'm saying? Started making up stories like, oh, yes, I seen her running across the water. And she was not inside the water, but above the water. And flames shooting upon her hands. Yes, I saw it myself. You know, all these guys lying and shit. Talking so while they witness this, they witness that. I'd have fun with them later. I'd have fun with them later. But for now, I was intent on fucking up her shit right now. And that's what I did. So, you know, this trial, they yelling and screaming, throwing rocks at her and shit, kind of stoner. She's all hurt up, beat up, bloody and shit. Now she's starting to suffer. Because she's like, I have been a full faith for the Lord, Jesus, and God. Why shall I die like this? As soon as she questioned, as soon as she questioned, I slid right in. Mmm, tasty, delicious, suffering it was. Oh, to feel betrayed, to feel betrayed by your own God. Oh, oh, that's, that's some good suffering right there. Oh, she was letting me have it, deliciously, deliciously. Because she knew, she already knew, she was going to die. And there's no, no way that anything was going to save her. No way that anything was going to save her, you know what I mean? Because I fucked all her shit up. So, you know, the day comes when they're supposed to burn her at the stake. And I'm sitting there like it's a fucking barbecue. Because trust me when I tell you, if there's some good suffering, if there's some good suffering, it's being burned alive. Oh, especially when you didn't do anything wrong. Oh, I mean, it's not that delicious when, like, the person who's getting burned alive deserves to get burned alive. Because they know they deserve it. I mean, they still suffer, nonetheless. So there's still some, you know, fine eating there. But not as good as a person who's completely and totally innocent. Of the charges brought against them, and they get burned at the stake. Oh, I tell you, it was like filet mignon cooked perfectly. Oh, God, I was enjoying every minute of it. And I thought to myself, hey, these old timey 1600s people, I run around here getting a whole bunch of these people burnt at the stake. Ah, and that's what I did for a long time. I ran around Connecticut making certain people do certain shit. And then, you know, people, you fucking, it's all witchcraft, sorcery, met with burning at the stake. And they burn them at the stake. And, you know, what would end up happening later? What would end up happening later is because, you know, these people were burning innocent people. Their souls would be tainted. So I had, like, fucking buffet throughout Connecticut. It's delicious. Oh, God. Every now and then, every now and well, before you locked me up in this goddamn jar and bottle that you keep me in, I used to go back to these places and feast on the souls that are still stuck there, roaming about. Why do I even ask you sometimes? I know why I ask, because the stories are interesting. You give me like a little piece of history and shit, so I, I like, this is why I ask you these things. But I should have known. I should have known. So yeah, that's what I found out from Rosmo about, you know, Hartford State House. Oh, and for those of you who thought that I was bullshitting, right, about Rosamund's glass bottle, haha, I have proof. I'm going to show you his old glass wine bottle that I keep in. Hold on one second. Uh, 
you know, just in case you guys thought I was joking around, there's Rosalind. Big ass bottle, like I told you. I wasn't joking around. You see the size of this shit? It's no joke. Now, I don't have to put a cork on it because it's got a special binding spell that keeps him in there. But he's in there, relaxing, and a bottle of Brunello di Montalcino Castello Benai. Yeah, this is his house. I also have this smaller green one yeah, that I keep them in from time to time as well. But yeah, I figured I'll let you all see, you know, because I know some of y'all thought I was bullshit and didn't really have these wine bottles that I told you that I have to keep them in. And I do have them and they're very old. So there you go. Ha ha. Ha. Well, that's going to end this afternoon's segment of Homie G's Stupid Scary Stories. I hope you guys are having a good Tuesday. Take care of yourselves. Take care of the ones around you. Stay away from the lamp, lamp in the corner of the cemetery in Burlington. You never know what crazy shit might come popping out of this hitchhiker. Don't pick up any hitchhikers. Don't pick up hitchhikers, period, because it's not a good idea to pick up a hitchhiker, and even if they're not a ghost. They might do some fucked up shit to you. You get what I'm saying? They might do some fucked up shit to you, and then you might be a ghost. You don't want to be a ghost. Till next time, people.